everyone. Welcome to our weekly program, A Glimpse into the Museum. My name is Charlotte DeCoster, and I will be your host to get today, together with our Chief of Education, Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson. And today's uh, Glimpse into the Museum will be a showing of one of our exhibition films, Rise of Nazism, followed by a brief discussion and Q&A on that film. Um, I want to first of all thank our sponsor, Bank of Texas, for making this weekly uh, virtual session possible. This uh, will be the last one of our weekly virtual sessions at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Uh, at the end of the program, I will announce our new uh, uh, summer programming, which will be uh, a new series called History Highlights which will be every second and fourth Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. So um, uh, you can uh, check that program out and I'll show you where you can find that on our website. So I just want to remind everybody that today is a webinar um, a lecture. This means that you can see us and our images have been recorded, uh, but you are not being recorded. Uh, and uh, it also means that you can only communicate with us through our Q&A. You can find that button if you're on a desktop or on a laptop on the bottom of your screen. There should be a Q&A tab. But if you're on a tablet or mobile device, you might have to look at the top of your screen uh, to find that Q&A button. In that Q&A button, you can leave us messages and questions, and we can have uh, a discussion there uh, with you uh, through that Q&A format. Um, I do ask if you can make your questions as direct and short as possible. It allows for a much more fluid discussion and us to read those questions and answer them um, uh, quickly. Do, um, as a little bit for our structure for today, since this is a film discussion, is first I'm going to give you a little bit of a highlight of where this film is located within the museum and our exhibition. And then we will actually watch the film. Uh, it is about 11 minutes long and it is called The Rise of Nazism. And then we will uh, talk a little bit more about uh, its function within the exhibit uh, gallery, and we'll open it up for uh, discussion. So I do want to warn you, since this film um, is on the rise of Nazism, uh, as with any film uh, connected to Nazism and the Holocaust, uh, there might be some graphic images in there. Um, this film is not uh, as graphic as some of the other films in our exhibition, but I do always warn that this is for a more mature audience. Uh, as uh, we watch this film. So uh, let's get started. So as you can see, um, this is a view into our Nazi Germany gallery. Uh, it is actually one of our first galleries within our Holocaust show Wawing. Uh, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights uh, permanent exhibition is, consists of four major wings. Our orientation wing, which is actually right in front of this gallery, our Holocaust show Wawing, our Human Rights Wing, and our Pivot to America Wing. And our um, Holocaust and show Wawing is very unique that it is geographically narrated, meaning as you walk through the exhibition uh, and uh, through this wing, you will actually go from country to country. And of course, we start in Germany uh, with the rights of Nazism and the different parts of the Nazi regime. And this film is really encapsulates everything what is narrated in this exhibition again. It is really to invite people of different ways of learning uh, to understand the rise of Nazism and how that connects within to the larger framework of the history of the Holocaust. And that is really the function of this uh, film is to give you an overall recap again of uh, this first uh, gallery. So, um, uh, I wanted to show you a little bit here. So it is located right here in the background. You see uh, the big lights uh, from the Nuremberg rallies um, uh, formation there. Uh, on this wall here, and we'll talk about that more, we talk about 1938 and the events that happened here. And on the right hand side, uh, the targets of persecution. So um, 
with that very short little brief intro, I'm going to get right away started and talk about the film. And afterwards, we'll come back and uh, talk a little bit more about the other parts of the Nazi Germany gallery and how the narrative continues forward from here uh, into the Holocaust Jawa wing and uh, what visitors can pull from this particular film. Okay, I am actually gonna turn my and mute myself and turn the main video on. were not prepared for defeat in World War I. The Allies enforced the terms of the Treaty of Versailles on Germany, which demanded disarmament and repayment for the cost of the war. Though reparations were then routine, Germans felt humiliated, powerless, and poor. The newly formed democratic Weimar Republic replaced Germany's familiar authoritarian government with an elected legislative body, or Reichstag. A chancellor with a cabinet to run the government and a president as head of state. The parliament reflected a fractured nation with 37 different political parties. One of the smallest was a group of unemployed World War I soldiers. Adolf Hitler joined this group and soon became its leader through his emotional and captivating speeches. He changed the name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, also called the Nazi Party, and promoted national pride, militarism, and commitment to create a racially pure Germany. Violence was often used as a political tool among some of the parties, but the Nazis excelled at it. In Munich on November 9, 1923, Hitler and the Nazi party led a group of over 50,000 in the Beer Hall Putsch, a failed attempt to overthrow the government. Arrested and tried, he was convicted of treason, using the courtroom as his stage to rant for hours against the government. Hitler gained fame and followers for his willingness to act. During eight months in prison, Hitler wrote the book Mein Kampf, that laid out a two-fold platform for Germany. Lebensraum, meaning expansion of living space, and a Judenrein Germany, meaning free of Jews. Mein Kampf became the base for the Nazi party's racist beliefs and savage practices. Upon release from prison, Hitler found a vulnerable Germany. The rising prices of inflation in the 1920s made the Deutschmark almost worthless and left thousands of Germans waiting in line for work and food. The worldwide depression of 1929 followed, spreading even more unemployment, poverty, hopelessness, and misery. The Germans were desperately looking for a solution, and Hitler's promised restoration to greatness. By the 1930s, frustration, fear, and political unrest were at an all-time high. It was not uncommon for political demonstrations to turn deadly. Nazi party support had declined, yet in the November 1932 elections, the Nazis won with 33% of the vote. In January 1933, an aged president, Hindenburg, appointed Hitler as chancellor. Neither the president nor the non-Nazi cabinet members trusted Hitler, but they were more petrified of intensifying political violence. Stormtroopers, also known as brown shirts, about 400,000 strong, were part of daily street violence, and the economy was still in crisis. Over the next 100 days, Hitler used fear tactics and manipulated events to dismantle German democracy. One month after Hitler took over as chancellor, a Dutch communist set fire to the Reichstag building. Hitler used this event as an opportunity to enact martial law, to suspend civil rights and freedoms. Police arrested and imprisoned political opponents. 
while the Nazis sent thousands to newly established concentration camps. Hitler's bold actions signaled to his increasing number of followers that Germany finally had a strong leader. His actions terrified his political opponents. Hitler appealed to the youth, telling them they would lead the way to the new Germany. The Nazi government started its merciless war against German Jews. Life was made so difficult, many felt forced to leave the country. April 1st, 1933. A one-day boycott of Jewish businesses was the first nationwide act directed at the entire Jewish community. On April 7th, a new law expelled Jewish teachers and professors, doctors, lawyers, judges, as well as ordinary government workers from civil service. May 10th, 1933, Hitler's 100th day in office. University students organized book burnings across Germany, destroying books by Jewish authors, as well as any other un-German books. In August 1934, President Hindenburg died. He was the last check on Hitler's power. Now both chancellor and president, Hitler declared himself Führer, meaning the leader. The military now pledged allegiance to Hitler, not to a constitution or to Germany. Soon, members of the Reichstag, civil servants, teachers, and police all swore allegiance to Hitler. In 1935, at the Nazi party's Nuremberg rally, new race laws, which became known as the Nuremberg Laws, called for sweeping restrictions on Jews in Germany. German law now defined Jews by the blood of their grandparents, not by religion or identity. Jews were denied participation in German national life and turned inward to draw on the strength of their community. Synagogues became centers for prayer, welfare offices, job training, stages for displaced actors and musicians, and safe schools and playgrounds for Jewish children. Hitler's ruthless ambition escalated in 1938. The invasion and absorption of Austria into the Reich in March advanced Hitler's goal to reunify all Germanic peoples, but it also expanded Germany's Jewish population. In the summer of 1938, 32 nations met at the Evian Conference to decide the fate of the European Jews, wanting desperately to flee Nazi Germany. They feared a flood of refugees would cause further economic hardships, and the conference ended with many excuses and little action. In late September, the leaders of Britain, France, and Italy met in Munich and agreed to let Hitler's troops take over the Sudetenland, part of democratic Czechoslovakia. Hoping that as Hitler promised, this was his last territorial demand in Europe. One month later, Germany expelled over 17,000 Polish Jews to a refugee zone on the German-Polish border. Herschel Greenspan was the son of two of those refugees. He drew attention to the plight of his parents when he fatally shot a German diplomat at the embassy in Paris. In response, the Nazi regime organized anti-Jewish pogroms all over Germany and Austria on November 9th and 10th. This was labeled Kristallnacht or the night of broken glass. The Nazis murdered almost 100 Jews and deported 30,000 Jewish men aged 16 to 60 to concentration camps. Meanwhile, mobs set fire to over 1,000 synagogues and vandalized 7,000 Jewish shops. And the German people looked on. In the days that followed, New decrees expelled Jews from schools and forcibly transferred Jewish businesses to Aryans. By January 1939, a new German law required Jews to adopt a middle name of Sarah or Israel. In March, Hitler broke the Munich Agreement and occupied the rest of Czechoslovakia. On August 23rd, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a pact promising not to attack each other. Hitler could now continue his aggression without fear of Soviet intervention. And on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded and occupied Poland. Two million Polish Jews fell under Hitler's control. Within two days, France and Great Britain declared war on Germany. 
Two weeks later, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east, dividing the country. World War II had begun. That is the end of the song. Reverse that for one second. So there's a lot going on in um, in this uh, 11 minute film um, that really covers uh, a little over 20 years of history. Uh, in regard with the rise of uh, Nazism, but it sets a lot of the scene. And that is really what this gallery is intended to do as well, as it really introduces the visitor to the history of the Holocaust and the geographic journey that the visitor will go through in this wing. Uh, it gives a little bit of the background about Nazi ideology, uh, the system of persecution, how it is uh, laid out, and then how it first is implemented in Germany, and then will get exported to the other countries that will be discussed in the rest of the Holocaust Chihuahua. So as the visitor enters um, the uh, permanent exhibition, they first go a journey on a journey in orientation wing that discusses uh, several key things. Is first, what, what is this museum about, right? Why come to a Holocaust and human rights museum? Uh, it uh, then uh, introduces to, uh, to the vis visitors the concept that we are not only here to uh, learn about historical facts, but also to explore a little bit that human behavior. And with that, we introduced the concepts of upstander behavior, bystander behavior, and also perpetrator behavior. Uh, then as the visitor actually climbs through the third floor uh, in a staircase, they see several projections that introduce them to the history of anti-Semitism, uh, uh, who, the, who are the Jews, uh, because a lot of our visitors are students and do not know what Judaism or who Jews are, and that is their first introduction to that. Uh, and then showing a little bit of um, uh, life of European Jews before the war started. And it's actually a collage of pictures of uh, family members of our local survivor community and images of them with their families before the war. Uh, then you uh, exit the orientation uh, wing and immediately arrive in the Nazi Germany gallery. And you face this uh, ginormous book that you see here standing, you see these two visitors looking at, uh, which has, uh, is actually uh, an open cover of Mein Kampf. And the sound as you walk in is uh, Hitler continuously screaming at you and these speeches of him in German nonstop talking to you as you're standing here. And what you see on the book and what you see here are several quotes throughout the years from speeches and letters and, and other uh, excerpts from Hitler of him uh, describing the Jews and his ideology in regard um, um, to the Jews. And a lot of this is that repetition of some of the anti-Semitism that you saw in the orientation wing um, of uh, the, the history of anti-Semitism there, some of the same words being used here uh, that come back up, but it all kind of gets wrapped up together here and how Nazi ideology uses that. And that really introduces the visitor to what we call Hitler's worldview and sets the framework of what uh, Nazi ideology was and the concepts of race and space, which you saw in the video as well, of um, living space and uh, racial uh, theory uh, within that. Uh, and then actually we go a little bit on a chronological journey depending on what path you take here in the museum. And you can go different ways. Uh, you can start um, uh, by our ginormous uh, Brandenburg Gate, uh, which really explains a little bit the system of how the persecution system in Germany was built from both the legal perspective with the Nuremberg laws, um, you can actually see a graphic here of the Nuremberg laws, uh, a little bit how the structure of propaganda was set up. We have an interesting film here as well uh, in the same gallery uh, that is a back and forward between Leni Riefenstahl's um, 
the triumph of the will and the eternal Jew. It's explaining uh, pro-Nazi propaganda and anti-Semitic propaganda and the, the differences between the two. Uh, we talk a little bit more about uh, the expansion of Nazi ideology uh, and how that fits in within the concept of uh, this Lebensraum. realm and the reaction to Jewish responses to uh, this really this framework legally, economically, socially, propaganda-wise, how this framework is uh, being built out. Uh, the wall that is actually opposite of that is our 1938 wall, um, which we call the beginning of the end, is really where in 1938, and you saw it in the film as well, is the switch uh, from building this persecution system to actually like fully starting to implement the different parts, uh, the annexation of Austria or the Anschluss uh, and Kristallnacht, um, the Munich agreements, these different parts where especially the concept of Lebensraum really starts fitting in, but also uh, the open attacks on the Jews with Kristallnacht. Most importantly here is because our exhibit is geographically narrated, we have this huge floor map here. You can see it on the images with in big black in the middle Germany and then all the arrows going out uh, is the uh, lines of the German um, army, the Wehrmacht, invading the other countries. And as you move forward out of this gallery, uh, you will go from country to country and kind of see how what you saw here in this first uh, gallery in the Nazi Germany gallery, how that system is expanded out from country to country to country. I do want to give a little bit reference to is that the main focus of um, our Holocaust show Wallin is on the extermination of the Jews, but in this Nazi Germany gallery, we also have um, an area here that talks about the other victims of Nazi Germany. Um, uh, which we call targets of persecution, and they are actually to the right, as you can see here uh, in the images, this area right here, you can see the big gates at Dachau, and then the different panels on the different victim groups, uh, right next to uh, the film that we just saw as well. And that is kind of the situation where this film is set in. It, it fits within that whole discussion. So. When this film was created, we really, in a very short time frame, um, in about 11 minutes, had to one, get over 20 years of history and get these key points across um, that uh, could enhance the information that is already on the panels, on the floor maps, on all the different things in this gallery, and add some visuals that we did not have space for within the gallery, right? Some of that is uh, video footage of that would be very impactful to visitors to understand uh, the rise of Nazism, right? I think one of those parts is uh, in the 1920s, that civil war raging in the streets of Germany, and a lot of uh, our visitors don't have an understanding of what that was like. So showing these kind of outbreaks, these fights on the streets, uh, showing video footage of that, a lot of people have never seen that. And showing that um, is important. It creates a little bit more of an effect uh, to show what really was going on into the 1920s, besides just the still uh, film footage as well. Uh, but then also some of the film footage of some of the conferences and meetings that are held uh, from both the signing of the Munich Agreement, where you can see Goering hanging in the background while it's being signed, um, to the Evian conference, this meeting uh, where uh, different countries come together to really talk about uh, what is going on and, and, and the Jewish question, right? I'm putting that in, in, in quotation marks. Um, and um, I remember when we put that, uh, when the film was first being put together, I remember saying, wow, I've actually never seen video, video footage of the Evian conference. So, um, i had been studying Nazi Germany for quite a while, and the fact that I had actually never seen that was really interesting. So embedding some of those things that gives another way of viewing um, and looking at this uh, through film footage. The other thing is, is to be able to highlight some of those things that you see in the exhibit in a different visual way. Uh, what the film does is, um, especially when it comes to um, 
uh, persecution of the Jews is adding more images of Kristallnacht, right? On fixed panels, you only can put so many limited uh, uh, images in there, but when you use film, you can add more different scenes. And um, that is something that in the Kristallnacht scene is you, you see more different images than you would see in the exhibit. Another one is uh, the requirement of adding Israel or Sarah on the passports. Um, is you can kind of see uh, the change happening and, and Sarah and Israel being added into the film. And then um, using the tools of highlighting that in the passport is, is kind of just briefly showing it in red that we did um, have in the film. Uh, so there's um, many different um, ways that we use to film to really enhance this exhibition. And that is really important because once you move forward here, a lot of these basic concepts of propaganda, the Nuremberg laws, um, it, it builds, the exhibition builds on that as you geographically expand out. And especially the, this worldview that is part of the rise of Nazism. So um, if anybody has any questions or anything that they saw in the film, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A. Um, if you have a question or uh, maybe that you saw, is there something that you saw in the film that you thought it was, that is really interesting uh, that you might have not known before uh, or your overall view of um, the film as well? Is it impactful? Does it give you a sense of uh, how, um, uh, Nazism built up within uh, the boundaries of Germany. Um, as I'm waiting for some comments to come in, and, and again, you can use that Q&A button, um, either if you're on desktop or a laptop, it should be on the bottom of your screen. If you are on a tablet or mobile device, it might be on the, uh, sorry, bottom for a desktop and a laptop, um, on a mobile device or, or a tablet, it might be on the top of your screen. Um, the other part of the film is um, um, adding these quick bits in there, right, is, um, is given that um, introduction and given just the highlights. Um, this is very um, important when we are working with students. Um, uh, they, um, you know, have a limited time to visit the museum and, and have uh, a short time to be introduced. So we use this film a lot to kind of give them that quick introduction to the rise of uh, Nazism, especially because many come in and they have really no or very little understanding of all of this. Um, uh, Kim just added into the discussion, uh, this is a great introduction to Nazi Germany and answers a lot of questions our students have. So uh, thank you, Kim, for uh, sharing that as a, um, as a part as well. Ellen asked, was the name Sarah in Israel only in German passports? Yes, when within borders first, absolutely, of course, until uh, 1939. But as it expanded, again, that persecution system was expanded outwards. Um, so uh, when um, Germany occupied other countries, those same requirements came into place, for example, in Western Europe and in other uh, countries as well. So um, this is, again, why it's so important to look how the basic system of persecution is putting place in Nazi Germany because that is literally picked up and exported outwards to those other countries as well. Um, Dr. Abosh, is there anything else that you wanted to add from your perspective about this film or this gallery that you think is important? Um, actually, uh, there was a, a, an excellent um, question that came in from Steve Hannabot, uh, and it, and it it deals with kind of what's unspoken uh, in the film. It, so um, Steve asks about the election of the Nazis and he, and he, he notes that only 33% of the vote was, was garnered by the Nazis. So how is it that they become the ruling, the ruling party and the government? And it's an excellent question. Uh, and in answer to another question that was asked, it's one of the questions that students ask all the time. What you need to remember is that many of Europe's political systems 
are parliamentary in nature. They're not two party systems the way we have in the United States with winner take all. So either the Democrats win or the Republicans win. That's it. There, there, there isn't anybody else that, uh, that represents a viable uh, uh, choice at the polls. In much of Europe, you have multi-party systems. And the way a parliamentary system works is that you don't have to get a majority of the vote to be asked to form a government. You have to get a plurality, meaning that you have to have the largest single block of votes up to slightly more than a third of the votes in, in the lower house, whatever that might be, or in the single house. So if there's 18 parties running, and the Nazi party, the NSDAP party, picks up 33% of the vote, split the rest of that vote over 17 other parties, and the Nazis have the plurality. In other words, they are the single largest vote getter. And so what happens is generally whoever is the highest person in authority in the, in the uh, period running up to Nazi Germany, that would be the president, uh, von Hindenburg, invites the head of the Nazi party, being Hitler in this instance, to attempt to form a government. If with that 33% of the vote, he can attract enough additional parties to make himself a majority party, he then becomes the holder of power. And that is in fact what Hitler did. It took him almost a month to do it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an easy lift, but he managed to do it. And so that's why we highlight, even though he has 33% of the vote, that he is actually, he's, he's voted into power and then invited to, to form a government. He doesn't seize power, um, which is a mistaken notion that a lot of people, uh, people have. Charlotte? Yeah. Um, JR just asked, apart from the economic circumstances, are there other characteristics that de and details that enabled the rise uh, in Germany? Um, uh, Yes, is besides the economically you saw it in the um, in the film footage as well. The political system that Sarah just discussed is uh, the multi-party system, and, and the political distress is that Germany did not have a democratic foundation, and that the Weimar Republic was very weak. So political circumstances as well. Um, then also the fact that Germany and the society didn't really accept that it had lost World War I, that there was quite a disgruntlement against the Treaty of Versailles. Um, uh, and so again, um, uh, that is briefly, I, I know there's so much in that film that comes and goes. There's a lot of little short little uh, tidbits in there. Um, and um, uh, uh, that um, come through there as well. Uh, and then I always say when I talk to students, when we watch this film, I actually uh, do um, uh, also this with law enforcement groups and with some legal professional groups. We watch this film actually sometimes when before we go into the exhibition. And uh, one of the things that I always talk about is to not just see this solely as a German phenomena as well is that um, there's a reason Germany is able to expand this persecution system to the rest of Europe is that um, this this has appealed to the larger European uh, public as well and that um, this persecution system doesn't just work well in Germany but throughout the rest of Europe just to really see the Holocaust, not as just a German thing, but a European thing as well. Uh, so that, in a sense, is, is, is that some of the circumstances are not just uniquely German, because it's really European white phenomena, some of these uh, issues as well. And, and worldwide, too, right? The Great Depression, some of these economical issues with that. So um, um, Pam um, just said as well, I, I, I totally agree with her. It's a great film, especially the early years when World War I ended the riots and the economy of Germany then. And I, I think that fits in with the next comment of Kim as well, is that there are a lot of misconceptions about Nazi Germany and the rise of Nazi Germany. And um, especially sometimes they are even taught in the classroom. Uh, so that is also what this film, in a sense, does is dispel some of these misconceptions. And, and there's a lot of them. So we had to put that very quick into that film um, as much as possible and uh, get all of these little comments in there. So thank you for noticing that, Kim, is, is, is the dispelling of the myths. 
uh, which I feel is 90% uh, of what Dr. Abosh and I do is uh, when we work with student groups and oftentimes even teacher groups is this, uh, is this spelling of myths uh, around uh, Nazi Germany. Um, so what are the reactions that students have? Um, I think the students are often when they watch this film are really shocked uh, what is uh, that there's so much happened uh, to them. So sometimes um, when we do have more time, uh, we actually have now an online lesson uh, with this film as well that we use with teachers is we try to kind of break down the film and have a wider discussion with it. Uh, and that is really important is because there is so much going on from the legal to the social to the economic, all these different parts that uh, become uh, part of the system of persecution. What helps though in our museum is that we continuously come back to this narrative. Even when we get to the human rights wing, we have a gallery called the 10 stages of genocide in which we again break down the process of, of genocide. And you see many of these steps that you see here in the Nazi Germany gallery, you see them back again. Um, you see them back again throughout the Holocaust wing as well. So this is just the first introduction here. The film helps with that but we regularly come back to it. And I, I don't think there's anything better than repetitive learning for students. Uh, so this is, they are initially a little shocked here. It's a little overwhelming, but as you build up through the museum, it, it, it does help them. And, and they do appreciate this film in a sense for that. Pam asks, do you mention what Nazis did or how they treated uh, gypsies? Um, uh, so um, yes, actually, if you look to the right of the film here, we have that section called uh, Targets of Persecution. You can see it here as well, in, we, in which we list the uh, different victim groups. So they are not part of the film, again, because our Holocaust showing mainly focus is on the Jews. Uh, we take the big stance that they are the group uh, that is part of the Nazi ideology that are marked for full extermination. Um, but uh, we don't ignore the other victim groups, so we build like a whole section to it. Uh, and uh, one of them that we discuss is um, the uh, persecution and murder of the Roma, Sinti, and Lilleri. Uh, uh, we actually don't work, use the term gypsy in the museum because it is actually a derogatory term. Kind of, I always tell the students, kind of like you wouldn't use the N word. Um, a gypsy comes from the word um, gypping, stealing. Um, in German, it's Ziegener, which comes from Ziegen, is also the same thing to take away. Um, so we actually use the official terms into the, in the exhibition and uh, lay that framework out too, is how actually the system, such as the Nuremberg laws of persecution, um, that, they, they, the, that framework of the persecution of the Jews is then used to target um, the Roma, Sinti, and Lilleri as well. What we also do talk about is that it's a little bit more co uh, co complex is one, the system of persecution of the Romy, Roma, Lilleri, and Sinti uh, is expanded out through the Eastern Europe. There is no uniform policy like there is with the extermination of the Jews. Um, for example, in my home country of Belgium, uh, there's a very specific policy and many of the Roma are deported from Belgium. Um, uh, in other countries in Western Europe, that is not the case. So it is a, a very uneven policy um, in that sense. But so it's not in the film, but it is in this gallery. Yes. Um, Veronique asks, how does one explain the reaction of the Germans to these actions starting in 1933 onwards and Hitler having to manipulate the public to get them on board with these uh, to his plans. Um, well, there's different answers to it. So I'll, I'll give you my answer first and then I'll actually turn it to Dr. Abosh because our answers might um, differ a little bit. Um, first of all, um, uh, uh, as the film shows is um, Germany is in economic, political, social distress already in the 1920s. And that makes the appeal of what uh, Nazi ideology provides them very interested to the German 
to the German public. So it is a public that is eager to listen to some of these extreme views. By the way, not just Nazi ideology, but communist ideology as well. Um, there is, in the 1920s, a spike up for the Communist Party as well. And so these extremist parties uh, do have appeal in general. Um, they very speak to that middle and lower class that is really hard struggling in these economic times, political times, and especially in a Germany that is trying to find this way that has no base in democracy. That being said, of course, Germany is not the only one dealing with this. And, um, uh, and uh, add on top of that, that also anti-Semitism is not, nothing new to the Germans. And these concepts together um, do have appeal. Um, once we get to 1933, is, um, changes happen really quick. And a lot of those changes, um, taking oaths, um, government making decisions, it is something that many Germans have already lived under before Germany became a democratic republic. Um, and it is kind of, you know, not seen as a big deal and, and moved on. And, and it's not happening to me, right? It's not impacting me directly. Uh, and so it is embraced, it, it not embraced in a sense, but kind of oftentimes shrugged off. Um, again, going back to our law enforcement group that I work with regularly, is um, I, I talk to them is what does it mean that most law enforcement takes an oath uh, for, to Hitler uh, in 1934? Well, this is something that they've already done before under the German Empire. Um, this is nothing new and this is just another piece of paper. So uh, in the beginning, these just seem compounding events. Um, uh, and it is kind of, in a sense, that slippery slope um, for it. But, on the other hand, there's many things that could have happened to stop it as well. So that is kind of my view on that. I'm going to turn it to Dr. Abosh as well for her to kind of maybe give a little input on that question. So, uh, Veronique, I would um, su suggest that you be careful uh, in using the term manipulation regarding the the German public. Um, if by manipulation you mean propaganda to get them to move in a particular way or act in a particular way, then that doesn't make Germany any different from the United States or any other uh, democratic uh, regime in the 20s and 30s. Uh, propaganda is a, a regular and accepted part of, of doing doing governmental business. So that's the first thing I would say. And then to build on some of what Dr. DeCoster was saying, be aware of the fact that Germany's democratic tradition, because we always call it a democratic tradition, it's a, bit of, it's a bit laughable. It's a grand tradition of 15 whole years. So their democratic tradition of 15 years is almost the same as their Nazi and totalitarian tradition of 12 years. I don't mean that they're comparable in terms of their substance. I mean just that they're, they're comparable in terms of the length of them. I mean, Germany does not come out of a democratic tradition or background. Germany comes out of an empire, and before that, Germany, Germany comes out of a, a whole series of mishmash of kingdoms and principalities and, and, and disunion under nominally first the Holy Roman Empire and before the Holy Roman Empire under under Catholicism more generally. So there's there's no history of this amongst the, the German people. What Germany does have a tradition of, however, is cultural anti-Semitism. Uh, and before cultural anti-Semitism, they have a tradition of cultural anti-Judaism. But they have a long, long, long tradition extending back more than a thousand years of blaming the Jews who live amongst them for, for their problems at various times of social, economic, and cultural uh, difficulty. And what Hitler does is he builds upon that tradition. He doesn't create the tradition. He adds a particularly murderous uh, dimension to it, and he adds the dimension of state-sponsored mass murder to the tradition. But these are traditions that underlay the fabric of German society. And this is in spite of the fact that Germany and France vie with each other for the title of most cultured and most civilized uh, in Europe. Um, and it gives you a sense that, that the veneer of civilization, and I'm not telling you something you don't know, I wish I were, the veneer of civilization is, is razor thin 
Um, and given the right conditions and the right historical background, it can flip on a dime almost. You know, one election um, can, can bring you to, to really, really terrible consequences. And then the final thing that I would add to this, uh, which Dr. DeConster was speaking of, is the fact that the Nazi uh, uh, regime is part of a larger ideological war that is being fought across the, the, the major cities uh, and, and countries of Europe from what becomes the Soviet Union in 1917 all the way across to the Atlantic Ocean, which is this massive, massive ideological and at times physical war. Uh, look at, at the civil war in Spain between 36 and 39, between the forces of fascism and the forces of, of Soviet communism. And so there are many who are terrified of a of a destabilized Germany, and and rightly so. I'm not I'm not blaming them, at least not for that. Uh, and Hitler represents one way to to they think guarantee stability within their country, uh, while this this terrible ideological war is being fought. Charlotte. Yeah, um, another great question came in from Celeste. Um, I see from the map how Germany invaded most of its surrounding countries, but why not Italy? That's a great question, right? Actually, we get um, students asking this all the time about the arrows on our map. You can see the, the golden arrows coming out of the map of all the different areas. And then you can see here on the bottom that Italy has no arrow going into it. Um, that is actually because um, Italy becomes an ally of Germany. Uh, the Germans are eventually very late into the war gonna occupy it when the Americans and the British are already liberating um, um, Italy uh, and Italy kind of starts falling apart. Uh, so there is actually no great invasion uh, strategy for Italy because it is uh, an ally. Uh, you're going to see the same actually uh, for Hungary. I can't, I don't think you can see it on the map here, but the arrows kind of go around Hungary and coming out of Hungary um, because that is an ally as well. It eventually does get uh, occupied as well, but that only happens when Hungary is at the point of shifting sides um, and uh, also leaning the other way and kind of uh, its ally. Um, partnership with Germany is collapsing, that's when it gets um, occupied as well. So um, that's why um, these areas don't have um, arrows uh, in it. Pam asked, in the museum, uh, do you go into why Hitler did not like or targeted the Jews? Yes, absolutely. That is um, actually going back. Um, this is just a small part of Hitler's worldview. We have a panel next to it. Um, also, um, that is such a common question. I would say uh, when we were still the Dallas Holocaust Museum and we did not have the platform to have uh, so many different panels and did not have such a large exhibit to work with, the number one question we got is why the Jews uh, from students? And, and, and it is something, even when I work with teachers, is to continuously the questions, why the Jews? That's why we spend such a major part of our orientation wing, actually not the Holocaust Human Rights Wing, but the orientation wing has a whole film on it, an introduction on what, who are the Jews? Um, starting all the way, actually going back to Abraham. <laughs> um, and um, the history of anti-Semitism, um, uh, going back um, to um, uh, Moses, um, the, the church, um, the building up of a more, with the scientific revolution of um, racial anti-Semitism as well. And that actually all precedes this. And then we pick up in, right here with that again, is these same terms that you heard in the film, uh, in that, uh, in our orientation wing, talking about the history of anti-Semitism, it picks up here again, because um, and that narrative doesn't just go away, and Nazism pulls a lot on these different elements that has existed for, in some cases, centuries. And then we continue with that is, is what the Nazis call rational anti-Semitism, and the explanation of that is how this becomes the core of 
Nazi ideology, and it makes for um, a, a scapegoat that has been used in history before and to use that platform again, um, especially because it can link to capitalism, communism, and all these different ways. And that pattern continues, by the way. It starts in the Nazi Germany gallery, but we bring that history of anti-Semitism back over and over again. We have a whole island dedicated to the protocols of the elders of J Zion, uh, which discussed this de document, but also Henry Ford's uh, connection to that. Uh, we discuss uh, the anti-Semitism from a Bolshevik Judaic myth, is this disconnecting between communism or Bolshevism uh, with uh, Judaism. Um, so that narrative con continues uh, throughout the exhibit and comes back uh, several times, um, even all the way at the end of the Holocaust, um, um, a, show, a Holocaust Shoah wing, uh, we have a whole panel dedicated to denial, and, and in a sense, is how that all of this gets refuted then again. Um, so it is a, a major continuous uh, narration because it is the biggest, I, I, it is one of the biggest questions we get when students visit the museum. So it is very important. Uh, and the reason I keep stressing students is because they're still more likely to ask questions than grown-ups. So I assume a lot of grown-ups have that question too. Uh, so when students ask it, we know that um, a lot of adult visitors would have that question as well. Um, uh, somebody pointed out uh, saying that um, they read that initially uh, the banning of Jewish stores didn't go well, which was portrayed in the film. Um, and, uh, um, uh, actually, in Germany, the first the, the Jewish boycotts starting in 33 and moving on in 34 forwards, uh, it depended what area of Germany um, actually went relatively well in most areas of Germany. Uh, Germany tried to expand that boycott outwards <laughs> into other countries as well, and that doesn't work well. Um, uh, it, that creates very negative response. So there's a little bit of a difference between the boycott that is implemented in Germany itself and the ones that they try to export outwards. Um, that um, boycott does not work as well. Just to kind of give you a reference, um, uh, one of our survivors, Maggie First, um, her, her, her mom and dad had a, a, a store, kind of a general um, generic uh, store with, uh, in a smaller town in Germany. And right off the bat, when Hitler came uh, to power, um, that store was boycotted and, and, and started doing really bad because um, many of the, the regular customers were not coming to them anymore um, uh, because it was a Jewish owned business. Uh, and although this wasn't a legal law or anything, it just shows that um, society uh, following this boycott uh, immediately there. Um, so um, we uh, have one more question that just came in. So Hitler jumped on board targeting the Jews because that was the best political stand to take as Nazism was established, or did Hitler have a personal reason for targeting uh, the Jews? Um, um, and I'll let Sarah respond to this first. I'll, I'll kind of give you my spiel first. Um, uh, is Hitler is a product of his time. Um, again, this is, we, we, you cannot see the Holocaust, a, a lot of people see the Holocaust as poof, in 1933, there come the Nazis, um, as aliens, they land down, and they bring, Hitler brings with him, um, anti-Semitism and his ideology, and then poof, in 1945, it disappears again. Uh, not, uh, anti-Semitism has existed for centuries, and, and, and using the, Jews as scapegoats is, is nothing new. Um, and, and so um, uh, uh, Hitler strongly believed in this, um, but he is not the only one. And so um, especially uh, linking that with communism um, and all the other uh, parts of it. Um, if you saw in the film, one of the leading generals from World War I, Ludendorff, is standing right at Hitler's side. Um, and leading the, this, um, helping leading this ideology. Uh, so that is very important to understand. Yes, it is a political stand, but it is also, a, a, in a sense, a personal stance is that's what he strongly believes in. He grew up in that climate, and, and, and this was 
part of the environment that he grew up in. Uh, personal reasons, I assume you're referring to Hitler's mother being killed by a Jewish doctor, or Hitler having a Jewish father. Those are all myths. Actually, most of those myths come from um, political enemies of Hitler who ran dirty political campaigns. Yes, even then, dirty political campaigns ran and people ran political campaigns against the Nazis that are quite dirty too, including accusing Hitler of being Jewish because they knew that would get at the heart of Hitler um, and uh, things like that. So a lot of those myths kind of have fermented. Um, uh, some um, uh, TV channels love to promote some of these myths as well. Um, uh, but um, this is, um, there's no proof that there was a personal, you know, that something personal in his life impacted them. Uh, really, um, again, you have to see this in the, in the larger context. And I'll turn this to Sarah too, because this is actually an interesting question to wrap it up with for today. So, uh, Pam, I, there isn't really much to add to what uh, Dr. DeCosta said. Um, <laughs> Americans, and I include myself in that, <laughs> in, in that great number, we have a tendency to look for an explanation for hatred. Um, you can't just hate because you hate. You have to hate because of a, for a reason. You know, somebody, somebody Jewish smacked around Hitler as a child or somebody Jewish was responsible for Hitler's father not being a great father, or Hitler's mother had him out of wedlock uh, and, and his real father was Jewish. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of explanations, none of which hold any, any uh, historical or, or scientific weight. Uh, the bottom line is that Jewish hatred was an age old hatred um, to millennia extent uh, hatred in Europe. Um, and, and as Dr. DeCoster says, Hitler was born into that same uh, atmosphere. And the closest you can come to this in the United States, and it's not the best comparison, but for argument's sake, I'll throw it out there, is long-term hatred of African Americans. Um, people born in the South, for better or worse, and obviously it's for worse, but, but they, they hated African Americans for, for centuries. Um, they were born into a, into a racially based society in which if you were Anglo, you were superior, and if you were African American, you were inferior. Is there anything scientific to this, anything culturally true to this? No, this is racism, pure and simple. Was it because you as a child were hurt living in deep South Carolina by somebody who was African American and therefore you developed a hatred from them? No, you got this hatred with your mother's milk. Um, and the Germans are no different. Um, this, is, this is simply a deep, a deep seated hatred that is not brought on by, by anything more than living where he lived in the times in which he lived. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope this was an informative uh, session and that you learned a little bit more about our exhibition and, uh, and this film. If you are a teacher, uh, there is a lesson using this film that you can request on our educators tab on our website under online lessons. Uh, and so it, it has a whole uh, lesson plan with it that you can use. So you're welcome um, to request that as well. And actually we'll get you access to the film. Uh, remember, this was the last one of our Glimpse into the Museum uh, series, so we thank Bank of Texas for sponsoring us. Uh, for the summer months, we will switch to our Tuesday evening program at 7 p.m. Uh, called History Highlights, and that will start uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays of June. So for all of our programming, we have amazing other programming too. You can go to programs and events on our website. Again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to uh, seeing you for our other programs. Thank you.